Hi everyone, today I'm making another video on the possibility of an eternal past. Um, before I begin, just uh, like to quickly thank, again, the current, current patrons for the channel, Ninja Bam, Nirvana, Johnson AV, Josh, Mars Bars, Joe, and Riz. Um, thanks you guys so much. Patrons get early access to content like this, as well as some other materials, such as the detailed notes I made in preparation for this video. Uh, you can check that out if you like at patreon.com slash friction. Anyway, um, so I made a video over three months ago called Did the Universe Begin? And in that video, I briefly go over a variety of um, philosophical arguments for the conclusion that the universe began to exist. And I explain why I do not find those arguments compelling. Um, the first argument I considered was Robert Kuhn's uh, Grim Reaper argument, which relies on a sort of Patrick principle in my response, I said in passing that a more complete explanation of my issue with the argument would involve um, explaining the Patrick principle and why I think it's false. Uh, well, that's what I'm gonna do in this video or, or something near enough actually, because it, it turns out that the problems I saw with that argument are not necessarily problems for the Patrick principle itself. And the counter examples I had in mind could in principle be avoided by rejecting another key assumption, um, which I will get to. So although I will conclude that the Grim Reaper argument is unsound, my conclusion regarding the Patrick principle will be relatively modest. Either the Patrick principle is false or the other key assumption is false or both. But since the Grim Reaper argument requires both, it is unsound and so fails to establish that the universe must have a beginning. Um, so before getting into that argument and the issues I'm gonna raise with it, I wanted to first provide some background and introduction to Patrick principles. And the, the, so the structure of the video is gonna be as follows. So as I said, I'm gonna first provide some introduction and background to Patrick principles and intrinsicality. Then I'm gonna introduce Kuhn's version of the principle as he uses it in the argument. Third, I'm gonna discuss a, what I think is a pretty serious concern for this application of the Patrick principle. Fourth, assuming that that concern can be resolved, I will present a counterexample to this application of the Patrick principle. Finally, I will consider several objections and recap. All right, so, to my knowledge, the term Patrick principle originates with David Lewis in uh, his 1976 article, Survival and Identity, but it takes clear inspiration from Hume's dictum, according to which there is no object which implies the existence of any other um, if we consider these objects in themselves. And that's taken from the treaties of human nature. Patrick principles are principles of modal epistemology. That is tools for inferring possible worlds, things, or states of affairs. The basic idea is that states of affairs or things possible independently are possible together. Um, for example, if, if a lamp could exist and a, a desk could exist, it is possible that a lamp exists on or adjacent to a desk. Right? That's a sort of inference permitted by um, Patrick principles, generally speaking. Lewis originally stated the principle as follows in the aforementioned article, Survival and Identity. I rely on a Patrick principle for possibility. If it is possible that X happen intrinsically in a spatial temporal region, and if it is likewise possible that Y happen in a region, then it is also possible that both X and Y happen in two distinct but adjacent regions. There are no necessary incompatibilities between distinct existences. Anything can follow anything. Okay. And he later reiterated this principle in On the Plurality of Worlds, saying, we need a new way to say that there are possibilities enough and no gaps in logical space. To which end, I suggest that we look to the humane denial of necessary connections between distinct existences. To express the plenitude of possible worlds, I require a principle of recombination, according to which patching together parts of different possible worlds yields another possible world. Roughly speaking, the principle is that anything can coexist with anything else, at least provided they'd occupy distinct spatial temporal regions. 
uh, positions. Likewise, anything can fail to coexist with anything else. Um, well, it turns out this, this on its own proved to be insufficient and Lewis found the need to add further qualifications to this principle. So first, uh, as, as I said in the, as the latter part of that second quote said, he requires that the distinct existences must be completely not overlapping that uh, the principle applies at least provided they occupy distinct spatial temporal positions. And next, he notes that the patches can involve merely possible things, saying that anything alien can coexist or fail to coexist with anything else alien or with anything else not alien in any arrangement permitted by shape and size. Um, this idea of alien things has to do with things which don't exist at the actual world, but exist at other possible worlds. Um, and what he's clarifying here is that the principle doesn't just tell you about possible combinations of actual things at other possible worlds, but possible combinations of things at any worlds, um, the actual world or other ones. Third, Lewis adds a caveat reflective of his modal realism saying, I cannot altogether accept the formulation, anything can coexist with anything else, for I think the worlds do not overlap. Hence, each thing is a part of only one of them. A dragon from one world and a unicorn from a second do not themselves coexist either in the dragon's world or in the unicorn's world or in a third world. A attached head does not reappear as a separated head in some other world because it does not reappear at all in any other world. It is right to formulate a principle of recombination in terms of similarity. But extrinsic similarity is irrelevant here. So I should say that a duplicate of the dragon and a duplicate of the unicorn coexist at some world. And that the attached talking head has at some world a separated duplicate. So we, we can understand uh, the idea here absent Lewis's committed, uh, commitment to modal realism. Um, so as to avoid potential difficulties concerning identity and trans-world identity, we say that what exists at the patch together world, um, the world you're inferring from other possible states of affairs, would be things which resemble um, in some way, those things which exist in the individual patches of the original ones, but are not necessarily identical or trans-world identical to. After all, otherwise we might be able to patch together uh, a world at which I exist adjacent to myself and um, it might be argued that I have a necessary connection with myself that this would violate. And there's a lot of other potential problems that we could run into even without being committed to sort of moral realism. So a fourth caveat that, that Lewis added was that the patches um, must be able to fit into a region of space time, right? So he says, our principle requires a proviso, shape, size and shape permitting. The only limit on the extent to which a world can be filled with duplicates of possible individuals is that the parts of a world must be able to put together within some possible size and shape of space time. Apart from that, anything can coexist with anything and anything can fail to coexist with anything. We can impose a more precise requirement of this size and shape permitting um, requirement uh, as Coons does. Um, that there is a possible world which includes non overlapping regions of space time which preserve the metrical and topological properties of those individual patches. Um, we'll return to this when I come to Kuhn's formulation of the principle, but getting a precise understanding of this won't be, won't be too relevant for our purposes. The next clarification of Lewis's principle we require is his notion of intrinsic. Recall that the principle concerns what happens intrinsically in a spatial temporal region. What, what exactly does this mean? <laughs> uh, and in his work, Lewis updated his conception of intrinsicality several times. He says um, at first that two things are perfect duplicates if they have the very same intrinsic properties. That was in this 1983 article in his extrinsic properties. And he later reiterates, we can define an intrinsic property of a region as one such that whenever two possible regions are perfect duplicates, the property belongs to both or neither, 
Likewise, a purely extrinsic property is one such that for any possible region, there is some possible region which is a perfect dupl duplicate of it and has the property. Um, and that's from his 1986 article, 1986 article of causal explanation. And in later work, um, see, especially Langton and Lewis, 1988 and Lewis, 2001, um, Lewis provided updated conceptions of intrinsicality. And that topic has been raised elsewhere at some length. For our purposes, I will not attempt to resolve the issue or endorse a particular account. But I think it is worth noting that we might want to be a bit wary of taking too seriously this principle, um, which relies on this uh, unclear and potentially controversial notion of intrinsic properties. At the very least, I'm going to try to tread with caution and, uh, well, we will return to this when I bring up uh, the potential concern. All right, that's enough sort of background. Let's move on to um, Rob Coons's article uh, and argument therein. So the article is from 2014 and it's called A New Column Argument, Revenge of the Grim Reaper. And I'm not gonna give a full explanation of that argument here. If you want a, a restatement of it um, and a, a brief explanation of it, you could see the early video, earlier video that I mentioned on whether the universe began. Um, you could also check out his article where he lays it out himself, or um, there are a variety of other places or videos that you can watch to, to discuss that. But the basic idea is that, look, there's, if you could have a beginningless sequence of um, temporal events, or um, if time could be dense in a certain way, dense in a certain way, then um, this Grim Reaper scenario would be possible. Um, you can infer that it would be possible given the Patrick principle, but it's actually not possible because it generates this paradox, it's contradictory. Um, so our initial assumption that you could have a beginningless sequence of events or um, that time could be dense, that must have been false. So the conclusion is the universe must begin to exist or um, the time must be discrete or something like that. And one of the key steps there, as I say, is inferring that possibility with using this sort of Patrick principle. Um, and it's that application of the Patrick principle to that case that I think is mistaken. Or itself, or it's that the Patrick principle is mistaken, but um, either way, that's where the argument goes wrong. But we'll get to that. First, I should state how Robert Coons defines the Patrick principle or his principle. And in fact, he gives two slightly different versions of it. Um, one is a sort of basic binary version, which takes two patches at once. And then, then there's an infinitary version, which takes um, several or even countably infinitely many. So I'll first state the binary version as he puts it. If possible world W1 includes spatial temporal region R1, possible world W2 includes region R2, and possible world W3 includes um, R3, and R1 and R2 can be mapped onto non overlapping parts of R3, R3.1 and R3.2, while preserving all the metrical and topological properties of the three regions, then there is a world W4 and region R4 such that R3 and R4 are isomorphic. The part of W4 within R4.1 exactly duplicates the part of W1 within R1, and the part of W4 within R4.2 exactly duplicates the part, part of W2 within R2. Possibly here, the, the requirement that there is a possible world that includes a spatial temporal region which satisfies the metrical and topological properties of the combined spatial temporal regions is an improvement, a way to make more precise the space and size, um, shape and size permitting requirement that Lewis invoked. Now, as I said, Coons also defines an, an infinitary version of the principle, which um, takes several or perhaps infinitely many regions and patches them together. So according to this principle, if S is a countable series of possible worlds, 
and T is a countable series of regions within those worlds, such that Ti is a part of Wi for each I, and F is a metric and topologically structure preserving function from T on, into the set of spatiotemporal regions of world W, such that no two values of F overlap. Then there is a possible world W prime, and an isomorphism F prime from the spatiotemporal regions of W to the spatiotemporal regions of W prime, such that the part of each world within Wi, within the region Ri, exactly resembles the part of W prime within the region of F prime of F of Ri. Okay. Understanding this precisely isn't so important. It's just a generalization of the binary version. You can take two patches at once um, satisfying certain criteria and infer that there's a, another possible world which includes them adjacently. Um, you could take many or perhaps infinitely many patches at once and infer that there's another possible world that um, includes them adjacently um, given the conditions. Taking um, exact duplication as is stated in the, in the binary version um, and exact resemblance as is stated in the infinitary version to be synonymous. The infinitary version, as I say, is, is just kind of an extension of the, um, the binary version, right? To allow the inference of possible worlds including several and perhaps countably infinite many patches. And accordingly, if, if the original, the binary version is correct, then that at least gives some initial plausibility to the infinitary version. Someone could object specifically to the infinitary version. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have any problem specific for that version of the principle. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of grant that these principles kind of stand or fall together. Now, uh, following Lewis's earlier definitions of intrinsicality in terms of duplication, Coons defines intrinsicality in the following way. He says, a property P is intrinsic to a thing X within a region R in world W, if and only if X is P throughout R and W, and every counterpart of X in any region R prime of world W prime whose contents exactly duplicate the contents of R and W also has P throughout R prime. Importantly, and this is gonna be a key assumption here, Coons requires that the powers and dispositions had by the Grim Reapers to kill or not kill given certain conditions or to create a particle or not create a particle given certain conditions or whatever, those are intrinsic to those Grim Reapers, right? They have that property intrinsically. So every region which exactly duplicates a Grim Reaper is gonna preserve that property. That Grim Reaper is gonna have that property in the duplicated region. Whether this is an appropriate assumption will turn on how we're understanding intrinsicality duplication. Um, and for our purposes, I'm gonna start by assuming that such powers and dispositions count as intrinsic. But actually, now that I'm gonna to return to the initial concern, we might see why that, that, that's potentially a problem. We might wonder how the Patrick principle gets employed here at all. So consider an ostensibly um, uncontroversial version of the Grim Reaper scenario. Um, where we patched together three such reapers from worlds at which none of them had to perform the task of killing Fred or creating a particle or whatever. What happens at the patch together world? Does the first Grim Reaper kill Fred or do none of them um, or something else? I mean, there might seem to be support for both options. So um, after all, in the patch together world, the first Grim Reaper is such that the conditions are met for, its, for it to exercise its power to kill Fred, right? No prior Grim Reapers killed Fred because it's the first. <laughs> um, but if that Grim Reaper kills Fred in this region of the patched together world, then this region is not an exact duplicate of the region from which this patch was taken since the Grim Reaper at that world didn't act. Remember, I. We took three Grim Reapers um, from regions at which they did not act. Um, and if we're saying that the first one, right, um, at, at the patch together world acts, I mean, 
it, it's, it's supposed to be an exact duplicate. So how could it be acting here when it didn't act in the original patch? Surely um, a space-time region in which a Grim Reaper does not swing its scythe or act or create a particle. There's not an exact duplicate of a space-time region in which no Grim Reaper swings its scythe or creates a particle. And on the other hand, if one of the patches involves a Grim Reaper killing Fred, um, one of the original patches, so to speak, then this will also occur in the corresponding region of the patch together world. Um, even if said Grim Reaper is not initial in the sequence of this world. And um, this has some obvious implications for the standard Grim Reaper paradox, since we have to specify the states of the Grim Reapers at the worlds, region of regions of which were patched together to form the allegedly paradoxical world. But it seems to me that no such specification could generate the paradoxical conclusion. If the initial, if the specification is that none of them are acting, um, that's like in a way consistent. If you have some of them swinging their scythe, okay, um, you know, okay, then some of them swinging their scythe. That's another consistent specification of the behavior of those Grim Reapers. Additionally, note that each individual space time region that is patched together plausibly only includes a Grim Reaper, right? And not Fred. I mean, this is, this is kind of how it's set up. We're talking about, Coons talks about how the Grim Reapers are possible individually. And this is so for the finite or infinite versions. But the problem with this is that if Fred is not included in any of the patches, how is he in the corresponding region in the patch together world? Consider the case where we are patching three Grim Reapers together. If none of the original patches include Fred, then the patch together region at some uh, world also cannot include a Fred. I mean, there could be a quote unquote Fred at that world, but it wouldn't be part of the region that we can infer, right? It's not part of the patch together region. And so that would entail that the Grim Reapers could not satisfy their tasks even in the finite case. Um, and presumably that's an invisible. If on the other hand, all of the patches include a Fred, then for the N Reaper case, there will be N Freds in the patched world. In this case though, are we supposed, are we supposed to think that a Grim Reaper kills their respective Fred? Um, if and only if no earlier Grim Reaper has killed their respective Fred? I mean, we could imagine this scenario, but this is certainly not how the problem was described. In the particle version, for example, a Grim Reaper has um, the power and disposition to create a particle and place it at a designated position d meters from the plane P if there is no Fred particle closer to the plane than d meters, and otherwise to maintain any Fred particle that is within d meters of the plane in its initial position. The question is, is the plane in the space in front of it um, part of only some of the patches, all or none? If only some, then what would the Grim Reapers in the other regions be doing? There would be no way for them to create a particle except by creating one in one of the other subregions of the patch together world, which is inadmissible. You'd have something from one region um, interacting in like another region, um, which clearly um, violates the non-overlapping um, criteria. Right, the regions have to be not overlapping. And if one Reaper is reaching into another region, that's those regions overlapping. We could imagine, um, as before, that all the Grim Reapers have their own plane in space to act in. Um, but again, that's weird. And, and it, the setup clearly stipulates that there's only one plane involved. More can be said about this, but and an immediate thought that someone might have is, wait a minute, wait a minute. There does remain something paradoxical um, because, well, I said that, like, look, any of the ways you specify the initial states of the Grim Reapers at the original world will result in a sort of consistent arrangement of them at the patch together world. But plausibly that isn't so because they're supposed to maintain, they're supposed to have this power intrinsically. 
And um, in the infinite case, any such specification um, is such that at least some of the Grim Reapers have not realized that power that they were supposed to have intrinsically, even though the conditions sufficient for its realization were met. Um, so for example, suppose the original patches were such that none of the Grim Reapers killed Fred. Well, at the patch together world, each of the Grim Reapers will have failed to realize his power to kill Fred, even though, you know, Fred was not killed by any prior Grim Reaper. Right? It should have killed Fred in that case. In the finite case, at least there's this similar problem, which is that if you have three uh, Grim Reapers um, from patches at, um, at worlds, none of which acted, right? So none of these Reapers swung their side at their original patch. There's no way to arrange them in the patch together world such that they satisfy the criteria. But there's still some, you could say that there's some um, patches such that you can combine finally many reapers in this way in a consistent way. So you could take one that acts and two that don't act and combine them in a world such that the one that acts is first and the resulting situation at the patch together world would be consistent. But nevertheless, um, their patchwork principle seems to permit arranging them in other ways. Um, and arranging um, patches of Grim Reapers that aren't, uh, that could, in, in, in no arrangement would satisfy the criteria. As I said, the one where none of the original Grim Reapers acted. And it seems to me that this problem, therefore, isn't just a problem for the infinite case, it's a problem for the finite case as well. Um, and that just obviously proves too much. Um, I, I personally, I just don't see a good way around this, um, this problem for the proponent of the argument. So, but how might someone respond? So, well, one response, which I think is the right response is to reject the assumption that the relevant powers and dispositions possessed by the Grim Reapers count as intrinsic. After all, it's a, it's a relational property, um, such that whether a particular thing satisfies it or counts as having it, depends in part on the state of things external to it. The alternative response to the problem would be to suppose that either that a space-time region which a Grim Reaper does swing its side can be exactly because of a space-time region which no Grim Reaper swings its side, or in a space-time region in which no Grim Reaper swings its side can be an exact duplicate of a region in which a Grim Reaper does swing its side. This is what you'd have to say to um, um, maintain the assumption that those powers and dispositions um, that the Grim Reapers are supposed, assumed to have count as intrinsic. That's what you have to require. But uh, it seems to me that <laughs> it's requiring that things Count as exact duplicates when they just are plainly not exact duplicates. You have a, a, the original patch, a Grim Reaper swinging inside, and you're going to have us believe that um, a corresponding patch in which the Grim Reaper does nothing, that's an exact duplicate of the first region? Um, no, it's not, right? But if we're interdefining intrinsicality and duplication, um, the exact duplicate is not going to preserve that property of you know, the powers and dispositions. And so that property cannot be intrinsic, right? As Coons defines it. I think this is the right response. I I'm going to get, come back to this. But at this point, the opponent of the Grim Reaper argument might feel content to reply on these grounds that the Grim Reaper's powers and dispositions should not count as intrinsic. And so, you know, it's not something that, which is necessarily going to be preserved when the patchwork principle is applied. So for example, in that finite case with three Grim Reapers where originally none of them acted, the world you're permitted to infer based on the patchwork principle is one at which you'll have three Grim Reapers, none of which act. And um, that's gonna violate the, um, powers and dispositions those Grim Reapers are supposed to have. Um, but that's not a problem if we deny that they're had intrinsically, right? They just don't count as having that property at the 
patch together world. That seems like the right result. And if this is right, then the Grim Reaper argument is unsound. Because recall, Coons requires the assumption that the powers and dispositions had by the Grim Reapers are intrinsic to those Grim Reapers. However, I'm going to suppose that some resolution favorable to the Grim Reaper argument can be made. Um, for I think that the principle or the application of the principle um, would still admit the clear counterexamples. And that I'm going to introduce in the following section. All right. The counterexample. So um, I'm going to assume that the issue raised in the previous section regarding the intrinsicality of the powers and dispositions can be resolved. In other words, um, I'm just gonna suppose that we can grant that those powers and dispositions would be intrinsic to the things that have them. And so we can infer based on the Patrick principle, um, the possibility of the Grim Reaper style scenario. The, if, if that can't be resolved, then, you know, um, I admit my counterexample is going to suffer from the same issue. Um, but in that case, the original Grim Reaper argument would also fail. I'm going to later return to that and the upshot of, of um, the counterexample and various possible responses. But the basic idea of my counterexample is, okay, assuming that that problem can be resolved, the original Grim Reaper argument, as I said um, earlier on, says, Let's assume for reductio that you could have this like beginningless, um, like non-overlapping infinite sequence of temporal events, um, intervals. Um, and look, we can infer from the possibility of the Grim Reapers and the Patrick principle and the intrinsicality of the dispositions and powers that they have that this Grim Reaper scenario would be possible, but that scenario isn't possible. Therefore, our assumption, our assumption for reductio, right, that you could have um, like a beginning of the sequence of temporal events or, you know, something like that, that had to be false because it allowed us to infer this absurdity. The structure of my counterexample, however, is going to make no such assumption, right? In other words, I'm going to present an example that I'm able to generate the same sort of paradoxical conclusion but without any, you know, potentially controversial assumption about possible space times or anything like that, which could be discharged. And accordingly, the only way to get around the counterexample is to reject one of the assumptions required for the original Grim Reaper argument, either the Patrick principle itself or the intrinsicality of the relevant powers and dispositions. All right, so what is the light bulb example. So we are to imagine that there are light bulbs with a special property, um, analogous to the Grim Reaper property, which is that for each such light bulb, it is on if and only if there's no light bulb to its left, which is on. And we can define the to the left of relation in this case as follows. So a light bulb L1 is immediately to the left of a light bulb L2, if and only if the bulb, the sort of glass of bulb L1, is touching the electrical contact of L2, okay? That's immediate left of. A light bulb L1 is non-immediately to the left of a light bulb Ln, if and only if there exists a sequence of light bulbs L1, L2, dot, 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 Ln, such that for each Li in this sequence, it is immediately to the left of Li plus one, of bulb Li plus one. So you can form like a chain of these light bulbs connected in this way. Um, and so finally, a light bulb L1 is to the left of an, another L2, um, if and only if L1 is either immediately or non-immediately to the left of L2. All right, um, so just to get this, the idea of this property across, let's consider a couple of um, illustrations. So here you can see the two light bulbs next to each other. Um, light bulb one counts as being 
to the immediate left of bulb two, so it's, its bulb is touching the contact of L2. And um, so therefore it also counts as being to the left of L2. Uh, simple enough. And uh, we can infer also in the four light bulb case, um, no bulb is to the left of bulb one. Um, bulb one is to the left of bulbs two through four. Bulb two is to the left of bulbs three through four. Um, bulb three is to the left of bulb four. And um, bulb four is not to the left of any bulbs. Now, given the state conditions for the bulbs, recall a bulb is on if and only if no light bulbs to its left are on. Um, we can infer that the state of these four light bulbs will be as follows. The first bulb will be on, bulb one will be on, and the rest, rest will be off. And that's a configuration which satisfies the condition for each bulb. And in fact, it's the only such configuration which does so. Um, yeah, good enough. So I think, uh, and if you had one bulb on its own, of course, that bulb will be on as well. So these bulbs are uh, clearly consistent, and I would say possible on their own, and possible in like a, a sequence like I've shown here. Um, but, uh, and that's going to be enough to generate the problem, to generate the paradox. Um, given the additional assumptions that we make in the gloomy paradox. Um, so I'm going to just take that and apply the binary Patrick principle. Um, and we can patch together sort of uh, strings of these bulbs to form different uh, larger strings of them. Um, and one way that we could do that in principle is actually to form a configuration of these bulbs that forms a circle, right? Um, there are many ways to do it, um, but consider the following two patches, right? You have this patch of eight bulbs that forms a semicircle. You have this other patch of eight bulbs that forms another semicircle. Um, both of the patches um, occur at worlds that are possible, um, no less possible than the four light bulb sequence. And we didn't make any special assumption about the space time here. It could, could be a space time just like our own. So there will be a third world, W3, which includes a spatial temporal region R3, which satisfies the metrical and topological properties of the combined spatial temporal regions R1 from world one and R2 from world two. And so following the binary patchwork principle given by Kuhn's, we can infer world W4, which has a spatial temporal region R4 isomorphic with R3, which consists of the individual patches from W1 and W2 patched together. Right, this just seems like a perfectly sensible application of patch principle as Coons would use it. And at first glance, you might suppose that what it would occur at the patched together world, the circle of bulbs would look, uh, like the following, where they form this circle, which has two light bulbs that are on, and the rest would be off. But again, this isn't quite right. Recall with the Grim Reaper case, we were assuming that the relevant powers and dispositions are intrinsic to the things which have them when they have them. Um, for the Grim Reapers, this amounted to the assumption that the power or disposition to kill Fred or not kill Fred, or create a particle or not create a particle or whatever, was conditional um, on you know, whether Fred was alive or whether any earlier Grim Reaper had killed Fred. Um, that We assumed that that was intrinsic, right? Um, and so it would be satisfied by any exact duplicate. And you know, we assumed that this was not a problematic application of Patrick Winkle in that case. And um, for sake of argument, I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that also in the light bulb case. And so in the same way, the power or disposition to be on if and only if no um, leftward bulb is on um, is taken to be intrinsic to each light bulb, which has it. And so satisfied by any exact duplicate. Accordingly, that sort of picture where you have two bulbs that are on and the rest are off does not, that's not what we can infer based on the patchwork principle to exist at world four. But what would exist? Like, what would be the state of each of the bulbs, right? In the same way that we can ask in the Grim Reaper case, what would be the state of each of the Grim Reapers? Presumably it's not enough to ask 
what was the state of them in the original patches, because they're supposed to satisfy their intrinsic powers or dispositions. And that, for some reason, the state of them in the original patches doesn't determine that. Similarly for the light bulbs, what can wave the light bulbs could be on or off satisfies the condition for all of them. Well, in this case, as in that case, there is no way, right? It's, it's already, um, it's an absurdity. So uh, let's, how can we show this? Um, consider bulb uh, one, which I, I've labeled here. If that bulb is on, um, then there's a light bulb to its left, which is on, right? Um, specifically itself. Um, to be explicit, there is a sequence of bulbs, L1, L2, L3, dot, 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 L15, L16, L1, such that L1 is to the left of L1, right? Hence, if L1 is on, then there's a light bulb to its left, namely itself, which is on, um, contradicting the criteria, right? It's on only if no light bulb to its left is on. Um, so accordingly, light bulb one cannot be on. But what is true of L1 is true of any of the light bulbs, Li. And so it's not possible that any particular light bulb is on. So they're all off. But then if all the light bulbs are off, then any light bulb, <laughs> for, any, for any light bulb in the, in, the, uh, in the circle, every light bulb to its left is off. Um, and so that, for any light bulb, it's failed to satisfy its condition. It's on if and only if no light bulbs to its left are off, but all the light bulbs to its left are off and it's still not on. Um, so we've sh therefore shown both that none of the light bulbs can be on, but also that they can't all be off. And this is a contradiction. It's like we're saying that they, they must be off, all off, but they can't be all off. Right. <laughs> um, accordingly, the particular light bulb scenario described is not possible. So, what's the relevance of this to the Grim Reaper argument? Um, well, in the Grim Reaper argument, the conclusion drawn was that you couldn't have a uh, past eternal or temporally dense space time. That's not possible. Because recall, it was an it was sort of an assumption for Redectio in the argument that you could have such a region, but given that assumption and these other assumptions that he's, uh, at least Kuhn's is committed to about the Patrick principle and intrinsicality of the relevant powers and the um, possibility of Grim Reaper individually and so forth, from those assumptions altogether, we're able to infer a contradiction or absurdity. But, um, and accordingly he says, well, from this assumption, you know, that you could have that sort of space time, we're able to generate absurdity. So reject that assumption. You can't have a past eternal universe or temporally dense space time. Uh, specifically, um, Kuhn's states it as the, the assumption for reductio is a non well founded infinite series of non overlapping temporal parts. Right. And he concludes that that's not possible. In the light bulb case, however, I don't require any special assumption of that sort. Nothing about the temporal series or um, any other potentially controversial assumptions required, at least by the lights of the proponent of the Grim Reaper argument. All that is required is the possibility of the light bulbs individually, the, assumptions that the, the assumption that the powers and decisions had by the light bulbs is intrinsic, and that the Patrick principle is true, at least the binary version. These assumptions are no less plausible than those made in the original Grim Reaper argument, right? You know, those assumptions being that the Grim Reapers are possible individually, just like the assumption about the light bulbs possible individually. Um, the, the, the assumption that the powers or dispositions had by the Grim Reapers are intrinsic to them. That's just like the assumption that the powers dispositions had by the light bulbs are intrinsic to them. And the that the Patrick principle is true. And that, um, be it the binary or infinitary version. And that's the same assumption I make in the light bulb case, right? Uh, so this, you can think of it this way. Kuhn's has these um, four assumptions. You can think of there being more, but let's just think about these four assumptions. The sort of um, 
you assume a possible sort of space time um, that's like beginningless or doesn't have a um, non over uh, non well founded uh, infinite series of non overlapping temporal parts, whatever. That's one assumption. Possibly the Grim Reapers individually, the intrinsicality of the powers dispositions that um, that they have, and the Patrick principle. Right, those four assumptions, and they turn out to be inconsistent. And he's like, well, I the latter three seem very plausible, so I can reject the first one, the possibility of um, those sorts of space times. What I'm doing is saying, look, I can generate the problem with just th assumptions like those three latter ones without any controversial assumption about possible space times, right? Um, and if that's enough to generate the contradiction, we've got to <laughs> reject at least one of those. But that would require rejecting at least one of the assumptions that Kuhn's maintains in the original Grim Reaper argument. Okay. And so since at least one of those has to be rejected, the Grim Reaper argument, um, which relies on those assumptions as premises, will have to be unsound, right? Now, this is a fine enough conclusion on its own, but we might still ask which assumption is most plausibly denied, right? Is it the patchwork principle? Is it the um, intrinsicality of the relevant powers or dispositions? Is it maybe the possibility of the Grim Reapers or light bulbs on their own? For reasons, previously adduced, I think if intrinsicality is interdefined with exact duplication, then I think that the assumption that the relevant powers or dispositions are intrinsic can be reasonably dismissed. It just seems like obviously false. There are arrangements of ex exact duplicates of Grim Reapers, as with light bulbs, which do not satisfy their supposed dispositional property, because um, whether they sat count as satisfying, it depends on what the world is like external to them. It depends on extrinsic features. And nevertheless, developing accounts of intrinsicality, exact duplication, and deciding more precisely the plausibility of principles like the Patrick principle is outside of the scope of this video. At the very least, my conclusion is that it's not both that the Patrick principle is true and that the relevant powers and dispositions had by the Grim Reapers are intrinsic. And therefore, again, the Grim Reaper argument, which requires both of these assumptions as premises, is unsound. And so fails to establish that the universe must have had a beginning. All right, let's consider some possible objections. Um, I think this sort of reasoning here is pretty airtight, but I thought of some um, things people might say in response. Of course, I there are probably things other people might say that I haven't thought of and um, you know, feel free to provide them. But um, this is what I came up with anyway. Objection one, the conditions for the state of each light bulbs are not rightly counted as intrinsic properties. And so those properties need not be preserved at W4. Accordingly, uh, the Patrick principle applied to this case would not entail that some paradoxical scenario would obtain. It would only entail that that coherent situation that I depicted earlier, where you had two light bulbs that are on, the rest are off, is possible, or, or something like that. That's what we'd be able to infer given the Patrick principle. Well, at this point, my response here should be plain. On one hand, I'm inclined to agree, right? <laughs> if we're interdefining intrinsicality and exact duplication, I think it plainly is the case that exactly duplicating the patches from world one and world two into world four is not going to preserve the given powers and dispositions of those bulbs, um, which entails that those powers or dispositions are not intrinsic to them. Um, what we have in that figure where there's two light bulbs on and the rest are off is a situation which exactly duplicates the patches from world one and world two. And you know those powers and dispositions are not preserved. The problem with this reply um, for the proponent of the Grim Reaper argument is that it, it equally undermines the inference of the paradoxical Grim Reaper scenario. Recall, recall my approach in, section, in, in the section where I discussed the counterexample um, was to suppose that the relevant powers and dispositions counted as intrinsic, even though this might be problematic for the stuff I brought up in the previous section, right? In the light bulb case, 
making the same assumption allows us to infer that a particular scenario is possible when it's fact, and in fact not, right? Um, I think this is this problem equally present in the Grim Reaper case. Those powers and dispositions shouldn't count as intrinsic there, and I don't think they should count as intrinsic in the light bulb case. But I wanted to say, well, let's assume that they do count as intrinsic and still explore a potential counterexample. And my counterexample makes that same assumption. But if you reject that assumption here, it seems to me that you should reject it there. If someone wants to respond and say that nevertheless, there is some relevant difference between these um, suppositions, and that only the Grim Reaper's powers or dispositions should count as intrinsic, not the light bulb ones, well, then they're free to argue um, that the issue raised here applies only to the light bulb case and not the Grim Reaper case. But, um, well, two things to note. I, I think it's sort of implausible to think that some resolution to the Grim Reaper case could be provided, given the stuff I previously said about that. And second, it seems to me that the situations are on a par. I, it's, I think that whatever resolution you could give to the uh, Grim Reaper case, it would apply equal, equally to this one. But I don't mean to the, for this to be necessarily conclusive. So, but as it stands, I think the light bulb counter, counter example at least seriously undermines the application of the Patrick principle in the original Grim Reaper argument. Objection two. Uh, well, the individual patches um, in the light bulb case are actually not possible. And so they cannot be patched together in this way. Well, um, why though? I mean, this seems to make sense only if the powers of dispositions had by the light bulbs are not possibly had by those bulbs in those patches. But this just seems implausible. I, I mean, the scenario is depicted where you had the two light bulb case or the four light bulb case or the eight light bulb case, or it's just a string of them, that seemed perfectly possible. There was no obvious absurdity in, in those situations. Why, why would that be an impossibility? And at the very least, it, it doesn't seem anything more impossible about them than individual Grim Reapers. Uh, one Grim Reaper or a few in a sequence are assumed to be possible. Why is it any more problematic to have a sequence or one uh, light bulbs um, as those seen in the original patches? Um, at the very least, that those situations seem on a par. And I think there's nothing really absurd with either of them. Objection three. What if we suppose that the relevant powers or dispositions had by the Grim Reapers are had by them essentially? Would there not have to be some sort of mysterious force preventing these light bulbs possible individually from being formed into a circle? Well, it is true that the light bulbs which have this sort of property essentially cannot be combined in this way. And you could think of this response as sort of reminiscent of certain problems with time travel. For example, that there would seem to be some sort of mysterious force um, preventing a time traveler from killing their own grandfather. And so I think, well, David Lewis had a basic response to this problem, and I think that's, that's more or less correct. This doesn't really do anything to undermine the counterexample. After all, the Patrick principle permits the impossible construction, right? The fact that the impossibility of such scenarios might raise further questions does not undermine the counterexample. Um, and Further, even if this objection were a problem for the counterexample, it seems to me that it would equally undermine the Grim Reaper argument. I, I did want to add as well that one thing you could, that could be true of the case where you're trying to, like, trying to push them together um, to form a circle, and you could do it with three or four light bulbs, not necessarily 16, but um, trying to push them together in this way. One, one thing that could happen is that for some reason or other, you just fail to push them together. <laughs> Another thing that could happen, which I think shouldn't be overlooked, is that well, you push light bulbs together, but at the moment that they form a circle, um, at least, the bulbs which had that property essentially cease to exist. And what remains now is light bulbs which don't have that property essentially. Um, that's at least a possible scenario there. Uh, there's, there's, there's a few ways you could um, um, understand this. 
but the main point is that it just doesn't do anything to respond to the counter example. There might be some weirdness in other ostensibly possible worlds. That sort of weirdness might be a consequence of the Patrick principle as it's applied here. Objection four. There is a relevant difference between the powers and suspicions of the light bulbs and those of the Grim Reapers. In the Grim Reaper case, Grim Reapers must check only if Fred has been killed or a particle has been moved or whatever the condition is. But the light bulbs depend on the state of a number of other light bulbs. This makes the light bulb property more extrinsic, right? relevantly more extrinsic than the Grim Reaper property. There are a few things to note on this. First, it's not clear in what sense the properties are relevantly different. In both cases, the condition of the thing in question, peach from reaper or light bulb or whatever, depends on the condition of some external state. For reasons previously discussed, on my view, both properties would count as extrinsic, right? Um, nevertheless, if the Grim Reaper property were to count as intrinsic, it's not clear what the relevance difference is such that the light bulb case would not count as intrinsic. Uh, further, I think, I think we could amend um, the light bulb example so as to more closely resemble the Grim Reaper case. So, so suppose whenever a light bulb is on, it transmits a signal instantaneously to every light bulb to its right. And a light bulb is off if and only if it does not receive any such signal. Here, the state of the light bulb depends on whether there is a signal as an input and outputs a signal to any rightward light bulb if it's on. In a way, this is the same as with the Grim Reaper case, except that the signal is transmitted instantaneously rather than sequentially in time. Right? It only has to check whether it receives a signal. Right? It may be possible to construct a variation of this which doesn't have the um, instantaneous requirement, but I'm not going to explore that here. Right? And, and this, this sort of property may not be physically plausible, you know, given stuff about um, relativity and so on, special relativity, but it is not, it seems to me, logically or metaphysically absurd. While certainly more can be said on both of the points here, both responses seem to me sensible. The light bulb property is not relevantly more extrinsic than the Grim Reaper property. And we can also, if we prefer, vary the case so that the light bulb property more closely resembles the Grim Reaper property. Well, objection five. The light bulb scenario involves an impossible causal structure. And so its possibility is not inferable from the Patrick principle. Two things might be meant by this sort of response. First, the suggestion might be that the individual patches involve themselves an impossible causal structure and so occur at no possible worlds. Second, the suggestion might be that the Patrick principle includes a condition or includes other conditions which entail that. The patch together world is considered possible only if the patches together would require a possible causal structure, if they have some causal structure. All right, the first observation to make is that the light bulb scenario has no specified causal structure. I, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's coherent to suppose that there is no causal structure. We just defined the states of them based on um, other states, right? The state of each light bulb just varies depending on the state of the leftward bulbs. If you want to suppose that some sort of simultaneous causation occurs, then uh, you may, but that seems to me coherent and in any case, not something required by the scenarios I've described it. Uh, the first interpretation of the subjection then is in error. The worlds from which the patches are taken, world one and world two, do not involve impossible causal structures. The second interpretation of this objection, well, there's two things to know. First, I mean, as far as I know, um, the patchwork principle has not been formulated in a way which has this sort of restriction. Certainly not by Coons, and I don't think by Lewis. So, second, if it does have this sort of restriction, if you did, you could, if you wanted, develop another. Um, Patrick Principle says, um, restricts the inference explicitly to worlds that have impossible causal structures. Then you could do that, but that principle is not going to fly in the original Grim Reaper argument because that's a case which involves an impossible causal structure. So, to be clear, I'm open to revisions of the Patrick Principle, which would preclude counterexamples like the light bulb case. 
But if these revisions would equally undermine the Grim Reaper argument, uh, that's, that's just going to be of no help for the proponent of that argument, right? All right, objection six. The Grim Reaper paradox uses the infinitary Patrick principle, whereas the Lightbulb case uses only the, pat the binary Patrick principle. Perhaps we could reject the binary Patrick principle and affirm the infinitary one, <laughs> thereby rejecting the Lightbulb counterexample with undermining the Grim Reaper argument. Oh, on one hand, this is sort of a fair point because that's, that is true that I did do that. But there's two things to note. One, I mean, plausibly, if the binary version is false, then so too is the infinitary ver version. I mean, the infinitary version was just a generalization of the binary version. I, I, it seems weird to say that it's more plausible than the binary version. Um, so, you know, if we decide to reject the binary version, um, if that's how we're going to get over the light bulb counterexample, I think we should reject the infinitary version as well, absent some strong independent motivation for the latter. More significantly though, um, I could have constructed the light bulb scenario with the infinitary version. You know, you could have taken one bulb at a time rather than two patches of 16. And um, then I would have used the same Patrick principle as, as used in the, in the Grim Reaper case. And so this objection will certainly not work. Um, all right. Conclusion. Um, the Rim Reaper argument for the impossibility of non well founded infinite series of non overlapping temporal parts relies on a particular Patrick principle. And it also relies on the assumption that the powers of dis and dispositions had by the Rim Reapers are intrinsic to them. First, issues with counting said powers and, and dispositions as intrinsic were discussed. I think. We should probably deny that the count is intrinsic. But second, I then bracketed those concerns, right? And presented a counterexample to Kuhn's application of the Patrick principle. And one that doesn't include any, any additional controversial assumption about possible space times or anything like that, right? It only includes the assumptions that Kuhn's needs in the original Grim Reaper argument. It was concluded that either Therefore, either the Patrick principle is false or the relevant powers and dispositions should not count as intrinsic. As I said, some motivation for the latter response was provided, but either way, the Grim Reaper argument is unsound. I, I finally looked at some possible objections um, and found them to be, uh, to not undermine the argument. All right, that's it. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Um, I know this is sort of a niche topic, maybe hopefully got something, something out of it. Um, I'd like to thank the patrons again, Ninja Bem, Nirvana, Johnson, Navi, Josh, Mars, Bars, Joe, and Riss. Check it out at patreon.com slash friction. Everyone else, please consider subscribing or yeah, liking the video maybe. <laughs> I don't know, whatever people say. Um, and uh, at the very least, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.